Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios. It is a beautiful, cloudy day here in Florida uh, on the 4th of November 2021. Significantly warmer than where my guest is currently sitting in Greenland. Joining us uh, is Vidis Kyokitsak, who is a, among many things, a former Mines Minister, Minister of Finance, uh, and had a few other portfolios uh, at various times in the Greenland government and now is in private practice running his own consultancy and advisory firm. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. Uh, Vidis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you and it's, um, it's a good opportunity for me to talk about Greenland and about um, uh, the challenges we face uh, not only in, in mining, but in general, in these uh, COVID-19 uh, times where uncertainty has struck uh, the globe or with the pandemic. And um, it has certainly made its uh, marks um, um, on Greenland as well. That's and, it. And um, I'm sure as a, small, as a smaller country and fairly isolated to begin with, um, has the has the, the the pandemic been a very very serious impact on the economy? No, not uh, until now. Uh, we've been uh, very fortunate of uh, having a very restrictive approach uh, to mitigate uh, the spread of the pandemic uh, from the early start. It is only for the past uh, two months that uh, we have seen a rise of, of uh, COVID-19 incidents uh, in Greenland, and it oh. has spread like uh, a fire, not only to Nuuk, but uh, to major cities uh, across Greenland. Oh, that's a shame. And th that and is that part of that delayed rise in the population because in the initial stages, you were very careful about keeping travel to and from Greenland to a minimum, but that finally ended. Well, I think uh, it's a combination of uh, the lack of um, focus, uh, first of all, to mitigate uh, uh, the pandemic and the measures uh, being taken by, by uh, the government. Uh, that is uh, one of the reasons why we have seen a huge rise uh, and a hike on the COVID-19 um, incidents uh, as we have today. It's a question of uh, taking the necessary political steps to, to mitigate um, um, the spread of, of COVID-19. And uh, it's been uh, a very successive um, uh, approach from the early start. But, um, but once the political uh, focus on the issue is lacking, then we see people not taking um, uh, the measure seriously. And then you, you experience um, incidents of people getting um, hit by, uh, by COVID-19, unfortunately. And oh. it's a question of, of uh, how uh, the political approach is on the agenda, I guess. Well, hopefully that gets they get sorted out pretty quickly. Every country on the planet has been wrestling with just what to do, and uh, sad, sadly, there's not yet consensus. But hopefully, you're you're going to get it done right. Um, you know, I think we first met when you were the minister of mines. We met in Toronto at PDAC right before uh, all of this calamity happened to us. Um, and I think one of the questions that a lot of our viewers have, who are not particularly familiar with Greenland and only here bits and pieces of news as they're reported when some you know, Western journalist decides they want to report it. Um, there was some confusion after the last election about um, you know, whether mining, uh, among other industrial developments with tourism and agriculture and fisheries, uh, was going to still be a key component of Greenlandic development. Um, you know, my understanding was, of course, yes, uh, with the exception uh, the government, this particular government is not very excited about uranium mining. Um, you know, maybe you could give us your, your kind of unvarnished thoughts on uh, the approach that Greenland now is taking under the Mines Act 
uh, and you know what, what you think the the best path forward is. Sure. The first of all, I think uh, the new government uh, has started um, uh, badly in terms of um, restricting our aims of um, exploring oil and gas uh, deposits in Greenland. Hmm. Uh, the new government banned um, uh, the option to explore uh, oil and gas uh, offshore uh, projects, which means uh, that Greenland has taken um, a very serious step of um, our measures to um, utilize oil and gas uh, resources that we think we have um, in Greenland, onshore yes. and offshore. Uh, the onshore activities have been uh, banned, um, which means that uh, it no longer applies as uh, an appropriate economic um, opportunity in the future once you abandon uh, the oil and gas resources no longer viable uh, in the political thinking. Then you take the next, next step, uh, a very serious step of uh, abandoning use of radioactive content materials not only uranium, but in general, restricting use, exploration, um, exploitation of various minerals with radioactive content uh, will be prohibited uh, and uh, a certain level will be inserted in, in the Mineral Resources Act, uh, which applies to to all mining companies. And I think it will make it uh, more difficult for investors like you to uh, make investments in Greenland, uh, not only in short time, but uh, in the next few years, it will be a very difficult situation because uh, once uh, we uh, exclude oil and gas uh, explorations, then we go to uh, the exploration and possible exploitation of radioactive content materials. So it will make it uh, difficult for Greenland to maintain um, a steady development that we have seen for the past many years of attracting investors with uh, the possibility of uh, utilizing um, the minerals, uh, including uranium and uh, and other rare earth elements with radioactive content. Uh, and mm. I think it's very problematic um, uh, to take such a measure and step, including uh, making a ban for exploration, but also um, uncertainty of uh, the existing licenses uh, that will um, doubt on the terms of uh, the conditions uh, to work on for the next uh, few years. And it's mm. unfortunate. That, that's an interesting concern. So it's not just that the government isn't going to grant an exploration license to go look for thorium or uranium bearing ores, but it also puts a, a company in danger if they are exploring for rare earths or, or any other uh, minerals, what happens if you accidentally find there's uranium in your deposit, right? Are you suddenly, have you spent all that money and now you can no longer go forward? Has, has there been a lot of, um, been a lot of kind of thought about those sorts of scenarios and how to address capital concerns? Well, I think uh, the government has um, done um, a few mistakes uh, on the um, effort to uh, revise existing uh, on my, and I think it's uh, very inappropriate to uh, not taking serious considerations of the terms and, of course, uh, the conditions are. Uh, for what's going to to apply for 
explorations and those who already have exploitation licenses. Once uh, uh, the ban and um, uh, the prohibition against uh, uh, uranium and other radioactive materials uh, applies, what is going to happen for those who already have uh, uh, an exploitation license? Are you going to close um, uh, the projects uh, down? And what effect will it have for the credibility of Greenland as an investment nation? And right. What damage is, is going to uh, be done against uh, uh, mining and the exploration in general? I think uh, we have many concerns um, that we need to take seriously, but it seems once the political decisions uh, have been uh, made, then uh, uh, that's what going to, to um, to happen, unfortunately. Wow. Yeah, that, that it's a it's a, it's an issue that is causing a lot of people a lot of headaches. But switching gears to, to the first issue, uh, you know, there there's there is ample evidence of oil and gas deposits throughout Greenland. I mean, I know some of some of the deposits that I know uh, of other of, of mining companies doing exploration. You know, this, if you step in the wrong place, you're going to get your boot covered in oil. So. Um, what was the rap? You can kind of understand people who don't like offshore drilling. They're concerned about damage to you know aquatic environments. They're concerned about fisheries. But what was the idea behind banning onshore exploration? That would seem to be a very excellent resource to 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 chase, both for international monetary purposes, but also furthering energy independence. What was what was the reason given? Well, it's uh, the offshore activities uh, that we are talking about uh, that has been banned uh, for oil and gas explorations. The onshore, as I understand, is still um, um, sought after and not- it's Still going uh, forward, I, my misunderstanding. So that's still possible onshore, that makes sense. It's still possible, but, uh, but um, uh, knowing that there are a few interesting um, places uh, offshore where we know there's uh, gas and oil leaking uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the seabed. Uh, I think um, it's unfortunate not knowing um, the size of the deposits that we know exist uh, mm. and not knowing um, uh, what the possibilities might uh, uh, consist that alone is uh, is a concern for me hmm. that we choose not to explore uh, the possible um, data and possibilities sir, that uh, we have declined in um, investigating further. And has that policy kind of changed back and forth over time? As different governments come in, or is it is this a very new development that we're going to ban offshore exploration? No, I think it's um, uh, it's what the current government um, is measuring, and I think uh, the tides uh, will change sooner than than later. I hope, or, um, and um, we will see many elements being uh, revised um, because there are two plucks uh, in the green and politics today, those uh, pro and those uh, um, uh, against uh, um, the utilization of uh, the resources and what measures to be taken uh, considering um, uh, what it brings for economy, jobs, and growth uh, in general. So I think uh, we see uh, the confrontation of two very uh, distinct um, politics uh, that apply today. And we see measures um, uh, being taken without um, serious considerations uh, because of 
political aspirations. And I think it's wrong and very damaging for the image of Greenland, but also mm -hmm. in our effort to, uh, to generate growth and jobs, not only in short term, but also in the long term perspective. Hmm. That's it. Is that is that sort of thing the um, part of what you're now focused on in your consultancy with um, foreign investors who are trying to find you know, the best path forward in Greenland, not just for the opportunities they see, but to choose those opportunities with sort of the the least political risk or the least risk that it's going to change back and forth, because unpredictability is 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 a hard thing to deal with when you're planning for long-term project investment. It is, it is very disruptive uh, approach uh, as I see it and not very healthy for the investment climate that we have been working so hard on, um, on achieving uh, for the past uh, uh, eight years. And uh, it's, um, it's a step backward as I see it in a very dangerous approach uh, that is um, doing more harm than, um, than good. And I think uh, the considerations uh, also raise doubt on, um, on applying, let's say the Paris Agreement uh, uh, to take um, um, an example. Mm. Uh, the decision was made without consulting the political parties in in the parliament uh, and it's um, a decision made by the government without consulting um, the parties and the parliament in such an important issue and i think it's a democratic uh, concern for us uh, once um, the decisions uh, are being taken that um, there is no discussion of what the outcome might do of benefit or, or harm for our economy and for our credibility in general. You just All described the, Washington, D.C. Yeah, but I think- <laughs> You just described exactly what we have here. No thought yeah. given to consequences whatsoever. Uh, but that is, well, it's, annoying and and i can make fun of it here in america it's a significant issue in greenland right? it is it is adhering to the paris accords for a small country like greenland that's still developing is a is a is economic suicide that just makes no sense there is a reason why we uh, declined of um, of uh, being included uh, in the accord uh, for for six years ago sure the reason behind it is uh, that Greenland is still developing um, and our desire to diversify our economy is uh, based heavily on the tourism and mining uh, besides uh, fishery uh, right. and um, energy uh, for sure. Uh, Greenland has taken a lot of measures of um, diminishing the CO2 emissions uh, for the past uh, uh, 35 years. And I think um, uh, that alone is a sufficient reason why Greenland is doing more to diminish uh, the CO2 emissions uh, compared with many other uh, nations. But thinking of, uh, of limiting uh, the possible mining uh, prospects. Uh, I think it's a wrong uh, turn that we have taken uh, in terms of uh, approving uh, the Paris Accord. Uh, and I think it's uh, very unfortunate uh, and done without considerations, unfortunately. Interesting. Uh, but at the same time, to be fair, there are concerns about future money investment. There are mines that are going forward now, right, that are going into production, that are hiring people. So there, there is some there's some growth there um, on those mines already permitted. Um, it's just, is it more of a concern about just longer term that, that foreign investors will get scared that they might invest in something and then have it yanked away 
by the next governmental change? Is that, that the main concern? No, I think um, uh, one of the things I have noticed uh, uh, for the past week is that um, the Greenland Business Association has raised uh, huge concerns on the revision of the Mineral Resources Act uh, that mm -hmm. is being conducted by, uh, by the parliament at the moment. And all the issues uh, that has been ra raised by the association and the mining companies and um, and businesses are, are not taken seriously, mm. and I think it's an issue that uh, we need to look at uh, what uh, the outcome will be once uh, those um, limits are being uh, forced into action. What is going to happen for those who have exploitation license already? but not dealing with radioactive materials, what is going to happen with them? Mm. Are you going to uh, force um, closure for, for them because of uh, certain elements of uh, the minerals that is uh, available? Or, or are you going to have some distinction or is it going to apply for all? Because I think there's uh, reason to uh, make distinction of those nearby existing um, society and those that lies um, in the wilderness or, mm. uh, doing no harm for any people. Um, so I think um, all of these considerations uh, had to be um, be discussed and um, and evaluated before such an important decision is being taken. And that's a really interesting and important point, right? Because there are huge, much like in America, there are huge open spaces where there are no population centers. So if you're mining there and you have to do some treatment of thorium or uranium waste or fluorine waste in a remote location, that should be treated very differently than if you're doing this eight kilometers away from a major population center. Um, do, you, do you get the sense in the evolving debate um, around the modification to the bill that that idea has some traction, that there, people are thinking about that reasonably, or is it just this blanket, no uranium, no thorium, I don't wanna hear it. I think it's uh, the last uh, thing that uh, applies, unfortunately. There is no distinction of the location of the deposits uh, that we are talking about. Mm. And it's going to be um, um, introduced regardless of how remote um, the deposits may be. It will apply for all uh, that has radioactive um, content. Um, mm regardless of it's uranium or not. Hmm. And I think um, we have a reason to, to doubt um, on what good it will do for, um, for an emerging nation like Greenland because um, mining is just uh, in a very early stage uh, right. and uh, we have a long way to go but once we, um, we uh, introduce various restrictions, making it uh, more difficult to invest in a climate that is already very difficult to, uh, to reach, um, how realistic will this uh, mean for developing uh, mining in Greenland? I think um, we will... Um, um, disclose a huge amount of projects um, um, that could be interesting economically and uh, to generate growth that we will have to decline uh, in near future. Right. Because uh, uh, the options for the investors and the mining companies will be um, 
to move to other places where there's no restriction or bans against certain elements or in mining. And I think once you start to distinguish uh, certain elements, uh, then uh, you, you become a selective um, um, uh, in choosing right. what has to you're, be different. You're narrowing the field it's, uh, for people. It's interesting. I, I know that speaking, spoken to investors around the world about capital going into Greenland uh, for mining. And the biggest things that, that leap out irrespective of the change of government and the uranium provisions uh, in the bill right now. Uh, more just logistics, right? Distance. So as you point out, you know, the, the, the global competitiveness for mining investment has always been very, very strong, very fierce. Um, and so Greenland's got a lot of positives in terms of ore bodies and um, being a lot of rocket surface, making mining simpler, uh, especially anything in the south of the country where the water is open 12 months a year is easier to think about than things in the, above the Arctic Circle. So all that's interesting. Um, switching gears, if we might, because I think um, one of the most, from an American perspective, one of the most, uh, uh, depending upon your political views, exciting, infuriating, insane, smart, good idea, bad idea, things that happened that, that raised the awareness of Greenland for Americans. Um, as you know, that my partner, Greg Barnes and I were in, the, uh, uh, in Washington at the White House talking about our rare earth deposit in South Greenland and the importance to national security. Uh, and a few days later, President Trump offered to buy Greenland, right? And the American media, of course, instantly, who hate Trump. So instantly, anything he says must be stupid. Um, immediately attacked him for this idea. But I'd love your comments because having, having been to the Great Museum in Nook, which, which has that wonderful exhibit showing the, the uh, Greenland's experience with Europe and North America, there were a few times going back into the 1800s where this idea was discussed, right? Like Greenland could become part of the US. I would love your comments on that. Uh, if you if you have any you'd like to share, my research of um, uh, dealing with Greenland and the importance of Greenland in in U.S. perspectives uh, have shown that the awareness of Greenland started uh, more than two hundred years ago, uh, prior to the conclusion of what we know today as the Monroe Doctrine, because um, um, during uh, the discussions of, of um, protecting what you call internal zone of the mainland uh, US, uh, there were discussions of the territories and, uh, and the country lying um, nearby US um, that needed to be considered um, whether if US should um, acquire those territories in order to enhance the protection of the internal zone. Mm. And the first records of uh, Greenland being mentioned uh, prior to uh, the doc Monroe Doctrine uh, was back in 1821, where Greenland had been mentioned uh, briefly as one of those areas uh, that needed to be considered. Um, uh, there were no discussion of uh, acquiring Greenland or other places except uh, signifying the importance of, um, of controlling uh, the areas um, uh, that is um, uh, outside um, United States uh, at that time. And I think um, um, the discussions of, of making um, radio communication, or at least for this, uh, um, um, the telegraph connection between US 
and Europe, uh, you had to make um, a connection at some time. Mm. And, and then you choose to go through Greenland to Iceland and then to United Kingdom uh, back in the 18, uh, late 1840s. For that, um, you established uh, a telegraph line uh, linking Greenland with Europe and U.S. Mm. and it signified a new start uh, of uh, telegraph communications uh, that included Greenland. Then you have um, the explorations of, um, of Arctic where many of uh, the explorations came to Greenland uh, as part of this uh, focus on uh, ensuring minerals and not least um, the geopolitical aspirations to control the Arctic, uh, uh, which uh, made the Greenland a very popular uh, place to, to explore oh, yes. minerals, etc. So, so Greenland's importance have been um, uh, been raised uh, um, increasingly for the past 200 years. And I think um, uh, looking at it, um, there have been a few situations where the discussions of uh, the purchase of Greenland have been discussed uh, prior to the purchase of Alaska in 1867 was the first incident where Greenland were, uh, was considered being uh, purchased by US. And the price at that time was uh, 15 million US dollars. <laughs> and Alaska was purchased for, uh, as I recall, for $7.2 million. And with that in mind, uh, the price was considered too high by US because Alaska was uh, purchased and was regarded as a no brainer at that time when it was purchased from Russia. Right. And then the next uh, attempt uh, uh, to sell Greenland was uh, back in 1917. And prior to that, uh, there were voices uh, making uh, the US uh, public aware of what Greenland uh, was about. I've seen um, New York Times uh, front page uh, from 19... Uh, 17, early 1917, um, with Robert Edwin Perry promoting the idea of hmm. purchasing Greenland. And for that, um, the vast hydropower potentials, coal, gold, copper, zinc, lead, even uranium was mentioned as the reason why Greenland was such an important um, country. Uh, to, to control that would uh, make uh, US um, a major player in terms of controlling the Arctic and why Admiral Perry was, uh, was promoting the idea of, of uh, making US to purchase it. At that time, uh, um, the Virgin Islands uh, were purchased by US Mm. And they had the opportunity to purchase Greenland, but this time the price had been raised to 25 million US dollars, uh, which were considered uh, too high compared with the benefits uh, that could be gained. You're, you're making, without intending to, you're making me nostalgic for an era when people in Washington thought that a price for buying something was too high. That sounds like almost a magical, mythical time to me right now, <laughs> given yeah. the fact we're about to spend $88 trillion on nannies as infrastructure. But anyway, we're back, back, back to Greenland. So 1917, and then it was around World War II, right? Because we were using, World Greenland became important um, for fighter bases or for, for plane refueling during the war. Was that the next time it, it came up or was it before that? Well, it was uh, during the Second World War that the um, uh, U.S. established military installations uh, back in 1941. 
and that was um, uh, the start of a much higher American awareness of the importance of Greenland, not only in terms of military, but in general. Now you know that uh, Greenland possesses vast mineral resources uh, and hydropower potentials, etc., that we have known for decades uh, prior to that because of, um, um, of uh, the size of Greenland. And I think um, um, uh, World War II provided uh, the necessary step for a country like United States to foresee um, the future struggle with uh, Russia at that time. Uh, on uh, who's uh, controlling the Arctic first of all, but the global global leadership was also one of the reasons why uh, the geopolitical um, statement uh, has to be taken uh, by purchasing Greenland, which is one of the, the reasons um, uh, that U.S. attempted to, to purchase Greenland in 1946. This time, uh, the offer was from U.S. 100 million U.S. dollars in gold uh, that was um, offered to Denmark, which declined uh, U.S. Uh, but the interesting argument from U.S. was that uh, it was considered uh, as... Um, a social experiment uh, from the from Denmark uh, mm. of having Greenland, which angered um, the decisions made the decision makers in Denmark, uh, that led to uh, uh, desire of developing Greenland uh, mm. rapidly uh, afterward. So Trump wasn't the first American to offend the Danes in how. He phrased his offer. <laughs> but I think uh, in the first two occasions, uh, uh, the option of purchasing Greenland was legitimate because uh, Denmark was, was willing to hand uh, Greenland to US for a certain amount uh, of money. But it was uh, after um, the end of World War II that um, uh, Denmark was reluctant of Mm. of uh, letting Greenland go. And I think um, it signifies uh, that uh, we were entering a new stage of, uh, of era, which meant that uh, Denmark had to consider um, uh, what uh, Denmark possess in general. And I think uh, the size and the position of Greenland it has such an importance uh, for Denmark that um, it would uh, make Denmark very insignificant um, if uh, they were letting uh, Greenland go. That's interesting. So the when we bought Alaska for twice the price, we could have had Greenland, we as the United States of America, which would have given us two significant coastlines on the, the Arctic, um, which right now has become incredibly more important as the, the annual ice is diminishing and it's making traffic in the Arctic more possible or easier without ice, ice breakers. Um, that must put, put Greenland now into a very powerful geopolitical position because we're not making any more land and we're not making more coastline on any ocean. So how has that played out recently? Uh, uh, to, I assume to Greenland's benefit, I assume it's a great leveraging point to have coast you know, above the Arctic Circle. Is that a current focus for your kind of geopolitical um, goals, the country's geopolitical goals? Well, uh, the self-awareness of uh, Greenland is, is of course, uh, that uh, we are a proud people and we know the significance of Greenland in terms of geopolitics, but also in terms of um, the mineral resources and 
the living resources that Greenland possess, which is uh, a huge factor mm. why Greenland is such uh, an important country. Um, what has uh, been developed uh, for the past 70, 80 years is that um, um, the defense agreement of protecting Greenland in 1946, uh, 41 allowed US to conduct um, exploration and research activities in Greenland, mm. enabling uh, US to grasp uh, what Greenland possess of mineral resources. Um, so it's because of uh, this agreement that uh, has allowed US to conduct research and surveys in Greenland and why uh, the scientific findings uh, of uh, activities conducted in Greenland has, uh, uh, has raised awareness of Greenland is because of uh, the agreement from 1941 hmm. that has enabled the US to, to make use of um, uh, Greenland in research and education, uh, trade, etc. All these uh, started because of uh, the protection and the defense of Greenland. Right. And it, it's, it's no, no relationship is ever perfectly smooth. And certainly it has not always been perfect between uh, the US and Greenland. Uh, arguably, we make a lot of mistakes. Everybody does, but um, one thing that that some Americans may have heard of is there was there was some some contention around Thule Air Force Base and how um, that was founded and you know there, it was it was not a particularly smooth process as I understand it from from the Greenland side is that is that relationship or that issue um, been perfectly kind of settled or satisfied. Uh, in terms of how Greenlanders view the, the, the American Air Force Base and or is it still sort of an issue that comes up from time to time and, and has no resolution? Well, you need to look at uh, what has been, um, been um, conducted in Greenland for the past uh, almost 80 years. That is, uh, is uh, military bases across Greenland. There has been um, up to 32 different installations, um, military installations across Greenland, where US uh, has been allowed to construct naval base, um, uh, naval bases and any Air Force uh, bases and other military installations, including uh, Camp Century on the inland ice, uh, because of this uh, agreement that I mentioned before. And so that, that has just been a long running part of how the relationship has developed over the years. Uh, yeah. Are there any sort of major points that you think are incredibly vital and important to people in Greenland that for whatever reason, you know, the, the broader international community or your, your sort of average American who's interested should know that they that they're not really aware of well there are many elements sir uh, in this um, agreement from 1941 that um, that includes um, um, a closer relationship between us and greenland uh, and it consists uh, a desire to develop uh, closer ties in terms of trade tourism, education, research, uh, et cetera. So uh, there are many positive elements uh, uh, in order to attract investments to Greenland. Mm. I think um, uh, one of the main aims of this uh, agreement is that uh, it should be beneficial for both parts and uh, that the investments uh, are to be uh, be done in order to generate uh, greater growth uh, and uh, revenue for both parts. 
and I think it's a good starting point um, to to make this um, arrangement um, known by uh, by the general public. Uh, sure. Uh, so I think um, uh, it has many benefits and um, and certainly elements uh, that can be um, be developed further without uh, us being uh, um, in dispute. Right. Well, I, 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 I kind of moonlight as a part-time, very strong member of the Greenland Tourism Board. Uh, everyone I speak to, I tell them they have to go visit as, as soon as they possibly can. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be great. I understand some more development is coming uh, more uh, uh, airports are going to be built with longer runways that could take flights because right now it's very difficult unless you have a private plane to get directly from America to Greenland, but it should be, it should be a short flight. I don't know. We're looking forward to that, but I sing the praises in terms of tourism. I mean, if you really want a tropical Caribbean vacation, it's not for you, but you want to go to a really beautiful place with nice people and the gorgeous scenery. It's a fabulous place. Um, uh, is, there, is there anything else I've missed that, that would be, kind of, you, you came into this thinking was really important that you know, our listeners get to understand and, and so they can do their own research and dive in? Well, uh, one of the things uh, that, um, that needs to be highlighted is of course um, the energy sector, um, not only the hydropower, potentials that Greenland possess, but uh, making use of the potentials um, that needs to be developed uh, further. You can think of a major development in terms of supplying electricity to, um, to US and to Canada if that was um, um, an issue, and I think um, uh, there are many possibilities in terms of uh, making survey of the possibilities, or, mm -hmm. and even perhaps uh, to generate um, um, a huge uh, dam project uh, in Greenland that uh, can be um, applied. Um, because we have so many remote uh, places uh, where those things uh, can be constructed uh, to benefit um, environmentally friendly uh, solution that uh, everybody is looking for. Yes, I think, no, no uh, carbon emission, that's, that's a beautiful point. And you've got, I've tried to explain to people how large Greenland is. <laughs> I've offered I've offered, offered them the idea of you know, trying to walk across the Grand Canyon to get lunch, right? Like it's it's it they're huge, beautiful, vast spaces. Um, and a lot of all those deep fjords are great places for hydropower to be constructed uh, in such volume that you could transmit it to North America. Yeah. But you mentioned the tourism as one of the obvious uh, choices that needs to be developed but it requires development of the infrastructure in terms of the harbor facilities, the airport facilities, the hotel capacity, uh, restaurants, et cetera. Yep. So uh, uh, it's only a question of, um, of making the right choices and to attract uh, the investors to make use of the possibilities uh, that only uh, can be limited uh, to our fantasy, I guess. Oh, your, your first low-hanging fruit are insane fly fishermen who already pay a fortune to go to remote places. Uh, and as I I'd said, you know, as you know this, right, we've, we flew over big chunks of our deposits in Western Greenland. The most frustrating thing in the world was flying the helicopter from rig to rig and looking down into these pristine lakes and rivers with these huge fish that are just asking to be caught <laughs> and I couldn't stop the fish. It was painful. So, you know, as soon as Greenland opens up again, more fully that uh, massive focus, get the fly fishermen and they'll, they'll pay an enormous amount. And they're not too worried about hotels, put them in a tent. <laughs>
Well, there, there are many possibilities. What I'm saying is that uh, uh, come and take a look at uh, what can be done in Greenland. And I'm sure the best way to, to make, uh, make it is to form a partnership with the local community and the people to, to make things uh, done. Yeah. And plus they know where the fish are. <laughs> I hate to be so focused on one issue, but <laughs> there are other great reasons for tourism. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for your time. Is there anything I, I've missed out that uh, we want to emphasize? No, but I think uh, we should continue this dialogue uh, with some more specific um, uh, topics um, in the future. But uh, I thank you for, for having this um, uh, conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we, we very much look forward to having you back. Uh, it's, 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 it's such a wonderful place and it deserves such a great amount of investment and growth. So to the small extent that we can be helpful in doing that, we're happy to. Uh, and to our listeners, thank you for, for, for tuning in today. And uh, remember to ignore the mainstream media and tune into Messy Times. <laughs> thank you. Ciao.